So uh, our final speaker today in this session will be John Everson. Uh, John is an associate project scientist uh, at the Swartz Center for Computational Neuroscience here at UCSD, uh, formerly of the Neurosciences Institute. Uh, he has long been interested in understanding human rhythm processing, why and how we move in time to music, uh, and what it can tell us about the brain learning and our evolution. Um, and he's done a lot of research in a lot of areas related to these topics, but today he's going to be discussing the Symphony Project here at UCSD, uh, formerly of the Neurosciences Institute. Whoa. Awkward. Yeah, time travel. Right? <laughs> uh, so today he'll be discussing the Symphony Project, uh, which studies the impact of music on child brain and cognitive development. Wow. That was that like a wormhole in time or something like that? Okay. Thanks, Sarah. I actually have the video on my screen and it's showing us about 10 seconds ago. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, and thanks everyone for coming again. It's been really interesting. It's a great pleasure to speak with these other researchers who are really you know, pioneers in doing these kind of big longitudinal studies. Um, and thanks to them for also paving a lot of the groundwork. I, I had to kind of guess what they'd cover when About preparing my talk, and I think it guessed pretty well. Um, <clears throat> okay, thanks a lot. Um, and thanks everyone for coming again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. That. Okay, we good? Sorry about that. Um, so, so the question about what, what can music do for kids, um, it, it's a big one, and one that we're trying to understand in terms of how, um, you know, affects both sort of specific cognitive skills, but also more general um, kind of, you know, personality or sort of person-wide aspects, attributes, you know, confidence. Um, <clears throat> lack of frustration, uh, you know, optimism, things like that. Um, so we're doing a similar study to what's been presented before, um, but I wanted to take a step back and kind of present maybe the larger framework that we're thinking about this, um, and particularly based on work that's going on in a variety of labs, particularly here at UCSD um, with Terry Jernigan and the Center for Human Development, um, which is, is kind of a, a an emphasis on large-scale studies of neurodevelopmental de trajectories, um, really trying to characterize, you know, how the brain grows in development. And so, um, in their PING study, they studied uh, over a thousand kids from ages two to twenty-two, um, and have started developing curves like this, showing how cortical area or cortical thickness um, develop over time. And this is what. Um, as Saul mentioned, that, you know, there are these large changes that are just happening to kids. Um, and you can see, you can define kind of a mean change. <clears throat> but what's even more striking, though, is how much variation there is around the mean, okay? And people have also mentioned the importance of studying individuals. So really the question is, well, what, what is the difference? You know, chrono chronological age is not necessarily the main um, variable here, or not the only variable here in terms of defining sort of differences between us. So um, a cross-sectional study like this measures each kid at one time point. And of course, what we really want to know is what happens to each of these kids. To the kids who are you know, far above um, this line, do they m remain up there as they develop, or do they tend to converge down to the mean? You know, do individual trajectories follow the average, or do they, do they do different things? So to do that, of course, we need to do longitudinal studies, so measuring people at multiple time points. Um, and so the kind of vision is much the same as, you know, you go to the pediatrician and you find where you are in stature and weight charts, okay? That's been happening for, what, you know, 50 plus years. <clears throat> and it tells you something about, you know, where you are in this trajectory. Um, and perhaps in extreme cases, it could suggest some kind of corrective action. Well, you know, really the same thing is going on in neuroscience. Can we develop these kind of norm charts for development of different brain areas um, and connections between brain areas? And, and like Nina's mixing metaphor, can we actually kind of make a profile of each child, each developing child, to say, okay, well, area X is on target, that's sort of age normal. Area, B, area Y is actually, you know, 
growing at a slower rate than is age normal. What can we do about that? Um, and what we're trying to understand is, well, what does music do to, to that mixing board? Does it change these trajectories in some way? Um, can it, you know, boost someone who's below the curve, further up the curve? And if so, well, in which areas can it do that? In which connections does it modify? So it's kind of a, a one way of looking at what we're doing is to try to understand, you know, really more specifically what levers music can push in the developing brain. Um, so, you know, this is the background interest, and I was just very fortunate to kind of have a, a number of things come together uh, here in San Diego, um, <clears throat> including, uh, as I mentioned, UCSD having this center that's really known for studying um, child development in, in a sort of a brain structural sense. Um, th they started something called the Pling Project, which is a longitudinal, pediatric longitudinal imaging, um, oh gosh, neurogenomics, no, uh, neurodevelopment and genomics, thank you. Um, so um, it's a five-year study, and so having that kind of as a background, I was able to piggyback a study of music on top of that. Um, another partner is the San Diego Youth Symphony and Conservatory, who um, have this community opus project, which is an El Sistema-based project in Chula Vista, um, low SES neighborhood in San Diego, or c city south of San Diego. Um, and they, they approached us with you know, questions, feeling that they are seeing great improvements in the kids, um, and sort of wanting to know more about what's underlying these improvements. Um, and I think, of course, as all arts organizations realize, well, if we can start to find some scientific basis for the things that we know in our hearts, music is good for kids, well, that's a good thing, too. Um, so, you know, maybe something we can talk about, but there's a little bit of tension there between the scientist who's really just trying to figure out what, what is happening out there and, and other organizations who, of course, have a certain sort of, you know, deeply held belief. And believe me, I, I agree. If you see kids, you know, starting off before musical training and then after one year, after two years, after three years of these programs, I mean, the change is phenomenal, what they're able to do. And you know, they probably would not have been able to do all that without the training. It seems kind of obvious. Um, and it seems kind of obvious that there must be changes going on in the brain to support that. Um, but, you know, it's actually pretty hard to f put your finger on, on those exact things. Um, so we're all on the same, uh, same page here. Um, so um, just the, the design of the study. Um, the, the kind of the initial ideal design was to have three groups, as Saul mentioned, a music training group, and actually and Nina too, an active control group, which would be martial arts, and then passive control. Because of the design of this study, I was basically um, kind of piggybacking on an existing study um, that was designed to basically be a community sample, just take all comers, more or less, not selected for one thing or another, um, but a large, you know, 120 person sample. Um, what I was able to do was to enrich parts of that study, parts of that sample, to have kids who were doing intensive music training in the El Sistema group. Okay, so it's kind of a hybrid. It's not like I could say, you're going to do music, you're going to be in the control group. Um, I kind of basically sort of took a subset of the kids that were enrolling in that study and made sure that they were doing music. Um, and the other difference is it's not really a cohort design, it's, um, I guess, cohort sequential. We're taking, started starting off with kids in a whole wide age range from five to ten years old at the start and then studying them as they go forwards for five years. And you'll see what that looks like in a second. So it's not like we're studying a single block of kids, um, a single age block. Um, so again, it's a five-year design. Um, this is very similar to the study that Asal um, talked about. They get behavioral cognitive testing, um, structural MRI to measure white and gray matter, um, thickness, volume, surface area, fiber tract imaging to look at the connections between brain regions, and as Nina has introduced, the um, looking at speech processing in the midbrain using the CABR. And so, quite simply, we're examining how music training impacts the development of language, executive function, attention, and what we hope is to try to understand how these changes are gra grounded in changes in brain structure. And so, a kind of simple hypothesis is that music training will accelerate developmental trajectories of brain and behavior. So, here's the sample um, at about year 3.5 um, into this study. So, um, each horizontal line is a single child. 
And so you can see that the age at start is distributed pretty widely between 5 and 10. Um, and then these uh, dots at later ages show kind of repeat time points for different kids. Um, so you see actually some of our kids have, um, are up to their fourth time point. Um, but others have only done one, so it's kind of staggered, staggered out. Um, so uh, right now, uh, what I'd like to talk about is basically the kids with two time points. That's 98 out of our total of 162, uh, which consists of 20 kids with music and 142 controls. So in this group of people with two time points, um, we have 17 with music and 81 controls. And you'll notice the, um, the active control group is not there. We, we simply were not really able to uh, attract enough kids doing martial arts. Um, if, if for you know, however much we tried, um, the group is only five, so it's really too small to really make any conclusions about. Um, okay, <laughs> the rhythm connection. So Nina introduced this. Um, rhythm is central to how we make meaning from sound. And as she, she talked about, synchronization of, of movement um, with the beat of music certainly a fundamental social activity. It underlies um, dance and, and you know, group music, but it has great significance for language and other aspects of cognition. Um, and one thing that I'm very interested in is how rhythm really relates to the prediction um, and attention to important times in the future. So knowing the patterns of time in the past helps you predict what will happen in the future. And you can see how that could be very relevant for conversational settings, language settings. Um, and, and the flip side is that synchronization is impaired in a number of um, conditions like dyslexia, ADHD, autism. Um, group here, Alex Khalil, Victor Minces, and, and Andrew Chiba have got something called the Gamelan Project where they've been studying the interaction of synchronization and attention um, and finding correlations that kids with lower synchronization ability have lower sort of attentional behavioral scores. Um, a kind of a, a, an opportunity here that I don't think anyone has really pursued yet, but it's kind of in the offing, and certainly in Nina's work and Alex's work, is, you know, can you actually then use rhythm as a therapeutic modality to try to, you know, remediate some of these things? Um, if someone with attention problems has poor synchronization, does it follow that improving their synchronization abilities will then improve attentional abilities? Um, there are certainly some theoretical reasons to think, yes, it would. Um, Nina has shown some, some biological reasons for suggesting, well, yes, it does, because it improves the temporal, temporal processing in the brainstem. Um, so that's kind of looking towards the future. So um, here's, here's data from a task. Um, I, I wish I had sound files like Nina had, but I'm glad she played those, because you can imagine. Um, this is basically kids tapping with a metronome. The red lines are the metronome beeps, and each row is a single kid. So this is our, our whole sample. Um, at, at baseline. And so it's sorted according to age, an increasing age. Um, and really the, the interesting thing here is that within each age group, um, you see some kids are, are right on and other kids are more or less tapping randomly. Um, and that's sorted within each age group. So um, the variation within a given calendar age is, is, is large, very large. And that's something we'd really try to like to understand why that is. So if we look, this is, this is kind of a, a mouthful of a graph right here, but if we look at um, synchronization variability when tapping to a metronome, so that's basically how steadily are you tapping. Um, and so a lower number means you're tapping more steadily. Um, so that's actually kind of a better synchronization score. Higher number means more variability from tap to tap. So we see overall, looking at this dark line, just kind of the average trend of data, as kids get older, they get better. Um, look, they tap with less variability. <clears throat> um, but we've also broken out the, the two groups. Blue are control kids and red are the music kids. Um, and so they're you know, largely overlapping um, and it's a little hard to make out exactly what's going on. But if I kind of fade out the control kids a little bit, you can see the music data a bit more clearly. Um, so it's clear that a lot of kids um, get better with time. Okay, as you'd expect. Um, and that those gains actually really depend more on where you're starting than what age you are. Um, and particularly kids that, that start off with worse scores tend to improve better. Um, and you know, this may simply be a consequence of the fact that there's only so far that you can improve. Um, so you can see that older kids, they tend to be more or less kind of flat. Um, that 
at least improvements are, are much less steep. Um, so that's interesting. Um, and the other thing is we can see that it's sort of never, never too late to improve. We have some, um, you know, five-year-olds that start off and improve by age six, but then we have some seven-year-olds that start off at the same um, kind of score as those five-year-olds, but they also get better in the next year. Um, so it just as kind of a first cut at quantifying this, we looked at the slope of these lines from year one to two. This is just showing um, the music kids. And we could plot it like this. So these are the slopes of all the different lines connecting um, their performance at, at year one, which is baseline before they'd done music training, and year two after one year of music. Um, so we can see that the, the music kids are much more consistently decreasing or improving in their scores, whereas the, the control kids are kind of you know, going all over the place. Some are getting worse, some are getting better. And that effect um, is kind of gone by the later ages, more or less, probably because of this, this floor effect. Um, so, um, you know, music seems to show more consistent improvement in this task. Um, maybe not, not too surprising. It's a musical task. It's a task that is relevant to music. But how does this connect with some other things, like Nina talked about? Um, so we're still pretty early in analyzing this, but a couple of things we found um, are some measures of phonetic processing. In this case, it's a, a blending words task. Um, it sort of measures how well kids are able to blend different sounds into words. Um, and it's a little surprising so far. So what we see here are, um, again, the same color code. Blue is control and red is music. If you look at these, these fits, we actually see that for the music kids, we see um, a relationship that um, lower synchronization score, which just means better synchronization, correlates with a higher phonetic processing score. Um, whereas with the uh, control kids, it's more or less a wash. Um, perhaps, you know, um, there's sort of no, no relationship between those two. And that seems strongly that there's, there's a strong, uh, not only an effect of music, that we see that there's a mean effect, that there's increased um, phonetic scores on the whole, but also this interaction, that the relationship between synchronization testing and phonetic processing is just different in these two populations. And maybe we can talk about why that might be during the discussion. So um, just kind of the final data slide here. This is a different test, which I haven't gone into. It's a test of rhythm perception, so not so much looking at the ability to synchronize movement with sound, but just the ability to perceive a beat in music. Um, and so. Uh, we have a, a parcellation of the brain into different regions. This is actually, um, these, are, these are regions that are uh, specified um, actually by genetics that um, across a large sample of people, um, sort of voxels in this part of the brain tend to be genetically related. Um, so it's kind of a genetic parcellation of the brain. Um, and it's, it's quite, uh, quite consonant, consonant with the functional and anatomical parcellations that we've seen. Um, what we can look at, it basically measures in each of these large parcels uh, our regions of interest to see how or if they have any relationship to, say, rhythm perception. So we made a model um, trying to understand rhythm perception in terms of age, um, which is critical because, as we've shown, there are huge age-related effects in all of these measures. Um, but then also in terms of motor, premotor cortex, this area one, um, <clears throat> dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, which is a pretty large area, but it includes supplementary motor area, um, and then just the overall brain volume. Um, and there were a lot of other ones that turned out not to be significant. So basically the strongest effects that we found were um, an effect of age, that essentially the, the perception score improves with age. Um, but also that there's a strong relationship um, over and above what's explained by age in terms of the volume of this motor premotor cortex. Um, that kids with a larger volume, regardless of their age, did better at this task. So it's interesting for a number of reasons. A, it's, this is a perceptual task, but it seems to relate to motor cortex, premotor cortex, um, <clears throat> which um, is, is, you know, uh, other work that I do in terms of looking at rhythm processing shows a strong, um, strong link between um, motor activity and rhythm perception. So I think I'll just wrap up there. And this is really just a summary of what I've said. Um, I'll just you know, make one point that was kind of made before, that, that 
by looking at structure, we can really look at the maturity of different structures. So over and above age, we can see how the maturity of structure corresponds with performance. Um, and just as far as points for discussion, um, we've had a lot of discussions about research design in terms of collaboration, ideal versus reality, community versus control. Um, and this is basically, you know, doing it in the lab versus doing it in the messy real world. Um, <clears throat> we've had some ideas for retention. You know, how do you keep kids and families involved over many years in these projects? Um, <clears throat> I think something worth discussing is really the kind of the balance between looking at, um, you know, focal brain and cognitive development uh, benefits versus more holistic benefits. Um, and obviously music is not monolithic. We're still at the stage where we talk about music as kind of a thing, and we need to get beyond that. Uh, and resources and policy have already been brought up. So that's it for me, thanks. <laughs>